This is a review of the cross product properties that we'll need to use in the second semester of physics. As a reminder, we're talking about operation like A cross B giving you a vector C. This is a vector operation, not multiplication. And the direction of C is perpendicular to both A and B and found using the right hand rule. I first introduced some of the basic fundamental rules for doing the vector cross product in physics 1 with respect to torque, but we'll use a lot more of it in physics 2 because of the properties of magnetic fields. You'll also learn about it in Calc 3, and by the time you've seen it in all three classes, you should be fluent enough that you'll be able to use it without any review when it really matters, which is in engineering mechanics. In this class, we'll see it in the force of a magnetic field on a moving charge, given by QV cross B, in the force of a magnetic field on a current flowing in a straight line wire, given by the vector L, IL cross B, and in the field B produced by a current that's parallel to the Z axis, given by mu naught I over 2 pi R, unit vector K, which shows you the direction of the wire crossing into R hat, which is the direction towards the field point. The basics are as follows. First, A cross B equals C is a vector product, not multiplication, and that vector C is perpendicular to both of those vectors. Because of the way it's defined, this operation is not commutative. The most important thing to do when doing these problems is to always write the formula you're going to evaluate, define each vector that goes in the formula, and put it in the formula in the correct order. If you don't do that, you'll get the wrong answer, because A cross B is not equal to B cross A. A picture can often help you understand what's going on, particularly the three-dimensional relationship and the rotation associated with evaluating a cross product. When you evaluate A cross B, you should think of a rotation that takes you from A towards B, with your fingers curling from A towards B. In that case, your thumb points out of the page in the direction of C. You might notice that if I go from B towards A, my thumb will point into the paper. That's what makes this operation not commutative. You have to do A cross B to get them in the order that you want for your particular calculation. It's also useful to define an angle from A towards B, which is the same direction that your fingers curl. So if you're going to evaluate A cross B, you want an angle that is defined as positive when you rotate from the head of the vector A towards the head of the vector B. That counterclockwise direction defines a positive vector C that points perpendicular to the plane of A and B and out of the page. Again, when you have a positive angle, that is a counterclockwise angle, you get a positive vector. A negative angle, a clockwise angle, you get a negative vector that would be into the paper. That rotation is a kind of curl, and I use that word deliberately because there is a vector operator called the curl, which is the gradient operator crossed into a vector. Okay, and the other detail is that the vector C is zero if A and B are parallel, and the vector C has its maximum value when A and B are perpendicular. You probably remember that from torque. Now, the most general method, one that uses unit vectors, is one that you need to learn to apply in my class for physics too, and that you definitely need to learn by the time you get into engineering mechanics. There are two equivalent methods based on just multiplying out the cross product. The first one uses the number line as a memory trick. You have to learn that i cross i is zero. Parallel vectors give you zero. And then you can use the x, y, z order of the Cartesian axes as a reminder that x crossed with y gives you z, that is, that i cross j gives you k. What you do then is use that memory trick and write out the i, j, k unit vectors in order from left to right several times in a row, i, j, k, i, j, k, i, j, and so forth. If the cross product takes you to the right, as in i cross j giving you k, illustrated at the bottom of the page, then you always get a positive sign. Here's how this works. If you have to go to the right to get from the first unit vector to the second, the result is positive and given by the next unit vector. So when i is crossed with j, the next vector is k, and it's to the right, so i cross j gives me plus k. j cross k takes me to i, so that's plus. k cross i takes me to j, so that's plus. If I have to go to the left 
to get from the first to the second unit vector. Like if I go j cross i, I have to go to the left to go from j to i. In that case, my answer is that next unit vector with a minus sign. So j cross i is negative k, k cross j is negative i, i cross k is negative j. The other method puts the vectors in a sort of cyclic relationship, i, j, k, as you see there, that's rotating counterclockwise, much the way you use your hand to indicate you cross your vector from x to y to get z. You still have to learn that i cross i is 0, but some people find this a little bit more convenient visualization of what it means to go from the x to the y to the z axis. The way this works is that if I have to go counterclockwise, which is always plus, to get from i from my first to the second vector, then I get a plus sign. So you'll notice when I go from i to j, the next vector is k, that's plus. If I go from j to k, like in that second line, I get a plus sign, because it's counterclockwise, and that takes me to i. And then k cross i takes me to j, again with a plus sign. If I have to go anti-cyclic, opposite that rotation, j cross i gives me negative k, k cross j gives me negative i, and so forth. If I go with the rotation, it's plus. If I go against it, it's minus. As another perspective, I show you something here that I also showed in the my physics 1 video, and that is you can write out a times table for the unit vector products. The dot product just gives you a very simple scalar result with ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Cross product gives you zeros down the diagonal because the parallel vectors give you zero. And opposite signs on opposite signs of the, of the table. That's because this operation is said to anti-commute. Mathematicians view this as an example of what's called a non-abelian, a non-commutative algebra. It's one that physicists refer to as being anti-commutative because you get a minus sign, an anti-sign if you like, when you commute the operation. A cross B is the negative of B cross A. Now, if both vectors are in the plane, like in the xy plane, like we had in physics 2048, then we can use the AB sine theta form, where the magnitude of the vector C is AB sine theta, and C comes out to be plus if it's in the plus k hat direction and minus if it's in the negative k hat direction. This doesn't work if the vectors are quite arbitrary, but when they're in the plane, it's quite easy. So again, I'll remind you that the angle theta is positive when it's counterclockwise from A to B. The order is essential. And then the magnitude of the cross product is a, b, sine, theta, with a sine. A couple of special cases are quite simple this way. If a and b are parallel, the angle between them is 0, so of course you get 0. If b is perpendicular to a and in the plus 90 degree direction, that is counterclockwise from a, then a cross b is just the positive result a times b. And if b is in the opposite direction, so that you have to go clockwise from a towards b, a minus 90 degree angle, then a cross b is negative a b, where I'm taking a rather loose meaning of the term magnitude. OK, and one final detail that I've also mentioned before, the most, the most, most, most general method is to use a determinant of a matrix. You put unit vectors on the top row, followed by the first vector, followed by the second vector, and evaluate its determinant. This is taught in the first week of Calc 3, and I really urge you to learn it because it is absolutely the best method for what I would consider messy vectors. It looks like this. When you do A cross B, you get the determinant of IJK across the top, the XYZs for A in the middle, and the XYZs for B in the bottom. Again, they have to be in the correct order or you will get the wrong answer. So that's all for this. One vector came picture came from chapter 11 of our textbook, heavily modified by me to fit what I want to say.